Okay, Second Peter. I want to talk a little bit. I always, we're going to start looking at something. I always spend a fair amount of time introducing it. Not, uh, as I say, you know, I, I often say, that's not downtime. It's helpful to get a bead on uh, these questions, these called introduction questions about who wrote it, where are they, what can we know about these things, because it helps us when we're going through and trying to track what is he saying, because uh, these letters are written to uh, specific settings and situations, and it helps us to hear them correctly if we have a, a bead on that setting. Now here it's going to be a little tough, but uh, I'm going to spend some time on it and in, in figuring out exactly what is the circumstance. Some parts of it are clear, but their location, for instance, is more, uh, it's a little more up in the air than some of the other things. All right, the authorship, the author is identified in, in chapter 1, verse 1, as Simeon Peter. Simeon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. As I uh, did when we talked about 1 Peter, here's a little chart that helps us, I hope helps us, in uh, understanding these various names that you see for Peter. And you think, oh, you know, that's just crazy. How can he be named Cephas and Peter and all this? Well, I'm trying to put, put some uh, structure to it so you can understand uh, what's going on here. Peter's given name at birth was the Aramaic name Shimon. Okay, so this is his name, Shimon. And then uh, when you transliterate Shimon into Greek, now transliterate, you're not translating. You're not saying, what does it mean? And looking for a, you know, what, what's the word for that in this language? You're translating, you're taking the name and trying to duplicate it in the target language. So that's what transliterating is. So here you have Shimon, and it's transliterated into Greek as Simon and Sumeon. There are two different ways of transliterating it. And Sumeon seemed to be the preferred way of transliterating Shimon in certain Jewish circles. But you had two ways that it could be transliterated, Simon and Sumeon. And then when you transliterate the Greek into English, that's how we wind up getting Simon and Simeon. So the, the name Shimon transliterated into Greek two ways, Simon and Sumeon. And then we get into English, it's Simon and Simeon. So that's what's behind that. But, but he also had a nickname. He had the nickname that Jesus had given to him in his new role as an apostle, and that name is Rock, and that was probably given to him in Aramaic, and the Aramaic term for Rock is Kepha. And so when you take that and you then transliterate Kepha into Greek, you get Kephas, and then when you transliterate that into English, you get Cephas. Now, Kepha is the is the, the word rock, that Aramaic word for rock. If you translate rock, not transliterate, if you translate, kepha is rock, well, what is rock in Greek? Rock in Greek is Petra. Okay, but if we're going to apply Petra to a man, we're going to, it, Petra, is, it's, it's a feminine noun. And so if you're, it's grammatically feminine. If you're going to apply it to a man, then you would change it to Petras. So we have <clears throat> Kepha, rock, translated in, as applied to Peter, Petros. And then when you have the uh, transliteration of Petros into English, is Peter. So it makes perfect sense. We have, you see, you have his name as Simon, Sumeon, Simon, Simeon, uh, Cephas, and Peter. All of them either dealing with his, his given name or his nickname. Now, Peter is most often referred to in the New Testament simply as Peter. But you get in the Gospels and also in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, his given name and his nickname are combined, yielding Simon Peter, or as in 2 Peter 1, 1, Simeon Peter. Usually it's just Peter, but you do get the combination where you get both Simon Peter and Simeon Peter. Now it's not clear why Peter identified himself in 1 Peter, he uses simply Peter, and then in 2 Peter 1, 1, he uses Simeon Peter. So it's, you just have to say, why is he doing that? And I think it's just a stylistic variation that doesn't have any significance to it. It would be like if I wrote to a congregation and I signed Ashby, and then next time I wrote to them, you know, sometime later and I signed Ashby Camp. I'm known by both, and it would simply, I wouldn't intend it to be anything significant. It's just that you know me as both ways, and so one time I said Ashby, another time I said Ashby Camp. That's what I think is going on. So one time he refers to himself simply as Peter. This letter refers to himself as Simeon Peter. He's known by both. 
And so I wouldn't attach any significance to that, but maybe some other people would. Now, you get further identification in the letter. So at the very beginning, he says, Simeon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. And then you get further identification of the author as the apostle Peter. You see that with these personal reminiscences that he gives in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, and chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. You get a couple of personal reminiscences where he's reinforcing, yes, I am the Apostle Peter. In 1, 13 and 14, he refers to the Lord's prediction to him, the Lord's prediction to Peter that was later recorded in John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19, that he would be put to death. In other words, he wasn't going to die a natural death. The Lord had had told Peter that he was going to be executed. He was going to be put to death, and he refers to that in, in 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14, he apparently found himself in a situation of persecution under Nero when he could, he could see the handwriting on the wall. He, could, he was close enough that he could see that the time for fulfillment of what Jesus had said to him was now. He was indeed going to be executed. So he refers to that, that uh, you know, back to the Lord's earlier prophecy. He sees that that soon is going to be realized in his life. And then in 116 and 18, he refers to having been an eyewitness to the Lord's transfiguration. So not only do we have him specifically identifying himself in, in verse, chapter 1, verse 1, as Simeon Peter, an apostle, but we also have these personal reminiscences of his that are from Peter the apostle. So you have those. Now, despite that, there, there were doubts in some quarters of the early church about the authenticity of 2 Peter. You can find in the early church there was, there was some hesitation, some reluctance. Is this an authentic letter from Peter? And there were some doubts about that in some quarters, and it was based on differences in style and vocabulary between 2 Peter and 1 Peter. 2 Peter, 1 Peter was, was widely known and was you know, uh, uh, just better known in the church, and so compared to it, there are differences, and that was part of why there was some hesitation. But as a commentator, Gene Green, in his uh, 2008 commentary on Jude and 2 Peter in the, the Baker Exegetical Series, he says... The evidence from the early centuries of the church in favor of the authenticity of 2 Peter is not robust, but neither is it sufficiently weak to preclude the possibility of Petrine authorship. The book was used early and widely, and although doubts did exist, the letter was never classified as spurious and eventually found its way into the major canons. Now, one of the reasons I think that you have some kind of skepticism or, or there was a hesitation about it. One of the reasons is that there were many unorthodox writings, uh, Gnostic-type things and other unorthodox writings that had been forged in Peter's name that were circulating in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. You see, so it was kind of like they were a little leery about things that had Peter's name attached to them because you had all of these things circling. So I think that that, along with the differences in style and vocabulary, between 2 Peter and the better-known 1 Peter, and then all these other things, I think it, it created some uh, reluctance and some hesitation. So it took a bit longer for the consensus to coalesce before it was said, yes, this is indeed an authentic letter of 2 Peter. Because there were a lot of these things in the 2nd and 3rd centuries going around. There was the Apocalypse of Peter, the Gospel of Peter, the Acts of Peter, the Teaching of Peter, the Letter of Peter to Philip, the Letter of Peter to James, the Preaching of Peter, the Coptic Apocalypse of Peter. So when you had all that circulating around, you can see it just, it just added to this hesitation and so there was a slower development of the a church consensus regarding the authenticity of 2 Peter. Now, though 2 Peter came to be recognized as authentic church-wide, today, most modern scholars deny that. Okay? I just always like to tell you what's going on in, in the, the, the bigger world. But most modern scholars deny that Peter wrote it. Now, their reasons for doing so, they seem to me to be insufficient. I'm not going to spend time going through them and then giving you rebuttals to them. Let me just say that there are a number of, of really good, uh, high-caliber current scholars who defend the authorship of, that Peter wrote Second Peter. You have, for instance, among modern commentators, you have Michael Green, Douglas Moo, Thomas Schreiner, 
and Gene Green. These are four modern commentators who defend the, the authenticity of Second Peter. And then you have a number of, of, of authors of modern um, New Testament introductions who also recognize that it's probable that, that Peter wrote Second Peter. In 1990, Donald Guthrie, in his, uh, his uh, introduction to the New Testament, his, uh, the second edition, and you have in 2005, uh, Douglas Moo and D.A. Carson's introduction to the New Testament. 2009, there was a, another one called The Cradle, the Cross, and the, and the Crown by Andreas Kostenberger and, and Scott Kellum and Charles Quarles. They also recognize that. So there are reasons that have, that have perked up that people say, no, I think this is a pseudonymous letter that you know, somebody was sitting in and they were, they were pretending to be Peter kind of thing. The arguments for believing that, I think, are, are not sufficient to overturn this clear, powerful evidence that we have in the letter. And I'm not alone in thinking that. It is a perfectly reasonable, uh, scholarly position to take. But I do tell you that when you go read around, you'll find, don't be shocked when you read and say, well, Peter didn't write Second Peter. You'll find people saying that. I'm not one of them. Okay, I, I go with what Peter said here. Now, here's from, from D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo in their uh, introduction to the New Testament. They say, The very fact that Second Peter was accepted as a canonical book then presumes that the early Christians who made this decision were sure that Peter wrote it. We are therefore left with the choice of accepting the letter's prima facie claim to have been written by the Apostle Peter or viewing it as a forgery hardly deserving of canonical status. Since the usual arguments against Petrine authorship are not finally conclusive, we prefer the former option. So that's how, that's how I look at it. And here's how Gene Green in his, uh, his recent commentary on Second Peter says. He says, the contemporary objections to Petrine authorship are not without their weaknesses, and we must not allow the volume of opinion to decide the case. By that he means the majority of modern scholars would say it wasn't written. You know, you have, as I say, you have a good, solid minority of highly uh, qualified people who would say it did, but the majority would say no. This guy says, look, you can't go on the volume of opinion. The verdict of the early church was ambiguous at first, but the problem of literary style in comparison to 1 Peter accounts for the early doubts. The book was used early and according to early witnesses used widely. The book is decidedly dissimilar to later literature that went under the name of Peter, such as the Acts of Peter, the Preaching of Peter, the Gnostic or Coptic Apocalypse of Peter, and even the early 2nd century Apocalypse of Peter. The concerns raised within the letter fit well within the struggles of the church of the 1st century, and we may reasonably affirm that Simeon Peter the Apostle authored the book. So that's me, that's where I am. The Apostle Peter authors the book of 2nd Peter, now, the, the, the fact that you have, uh, you know, as I said, you, the fact that you had these unorthodox writings, that contributed to this, uh, to this delay, I think, in, in recognizing this. Now, the relationship, you're probably aware of this, but there are, are definitely, there seems to be a clear relationship between Second Peter and Jude. There are a number of parallels. You've read them both. And you can see these parallels. There are quite a few of them. And, and these parallels between Jude and Second Peter, they occur almost without exception in the same order in the letters. So you have you know, a lot of parallels in there. And then not only are they parallels, but they seem to fall in the same order. Let me give you a chart here that I, I did from uh, an introduction to the New Testament from D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo. And you can see the parallels here. And I don't know that this exhausts them, but for example, you have false teachers' condemnation. Now, a lot of these use words that are very rare, sometimes only used in these two places. So they're very rare words, and then when you have that kind of, of parallel, using rare words, and then following in the, in the same, uh, basically the same order, uh, it, it indicates there's some kind of connection going on. Right? The false teachers, you see condemnation from the past. You see the verses of Jude on the, on the left. Second Peter, the, the verses there on the right. They deny sovereign or master and Lord. Uh, Jude has and Lord and Peter just has master. Verse 6 in, of, of Jude and, and chapter 2 verse 4, you see the angels confined for judgment. And here's a rare word, Zophus, for darkness. And you can, you can see here, Sodom and Gomorrah are used as examples of judgment of gross evil. In verse 8 of Jude, you have they reject 
authority. Peter says they despise authority. They, Jude talks of the archangel. Michael did not condemn him for slander. Second Peter says the angels do not heap abuse. And you go through here, false teachers, the reference of blemishes. Clouds without rain, blown along by the wind. That's Jude. Peter springs without water and mist driven by a storm. Uh, verse 18, you have scoffers in, in Jude, uh, scoffing ungodly desires. And Peter, it's scoffers following their own evil. So you have a lot of these, these similarity in order and the rarity of the language that's compared to language that's used elsewhere in the Bible. It suggests that either that Jude borrowed from Second Peter in composing Jude, or that Peter borrowed from Jude in composing Second Peter, or that both Jude and Peter borrowed from some other source in writing their respective letters. Now, when you say that, people gasp sometimes, but that poses no threat to inspiration. That, 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 that means that that doesn't raise the issue of inspiration. I believe the Bible is completely inspired and inerrant, but the notion of inspiration is more complex than someone sitting in a trance and God dictating, right? I mean, doesn't Luke... At the beginning of his gospel, Luke specifies in chapter 1, verses 1, 1 through 3, that he researched matters in writing his gospel. Okay, well, does that mean Luke then is not inspired? No. You see, God is large enough that he superintends the entire process so that what comes out at the end is precisely what he wanted written. He's bigger than that, you see. So he's involved in Paul's training Paul's upbringing, Paul's phrasing, you know, all of that. So he, it, it's just a bigger picture, so it doesn't threaten in any way the concept of inspiration or inerrancy. Now, the early Christians, they generally held that Jude borrowed from 2 Peter. That was, how, that was how they generally, what they generally thought about it, whereas most modern scholars think that Peter borrowed from Jude. They kind of reverse it. But the matter can't be decided with any certainty because we just don't have enough information. But I'm with, uh, with Douglas Moo and at least thinking that a comparison of when you look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, and you compare that with Jude 17 and 18, that part at least lends some support to the idea in my mind that Jude borrowed from 2 Peter. Now I say that because as you 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 <clears throat> he says, knowing this first, from English Standard Version, he says, knowing this first of all, <clears throat> that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And then Jude 17 and 18, again ESV, he says, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It looks like he's referring to that. Now, when it says, quote, there aren't quotes in Greek. So we sometimes say, well, quote, he's not quoting because, the, you know, there's variation. Well, there aren't quotation marks. You see, so he says, said to you that, and the last time he's given you the idea and the gist. So to me, that, that one piece of evidence at least supports the notion that the way this went was that Jude had access to Second Peter, and then he drew on that. But that's not enough to conclusively decide the matter. Now, if Jude borrowed from Second Peter then he was extracting points that were relevant to a similar false teaching with which he was dealing. So here, he's aware of 2 Peter. He extracts points from that because those points were relevant to something he was dealing with. If Peter borrowed from 2 Jude, then he's expanding on 2 Jude. I mean on Jude, 2 Jude, that's good. He's expanding on Jude, you see, in a way that's suitable to the situation that he was addressing. All right, so you can't be sure which way this went. It looks to me like there is some kind of borrowing some way, whether from each other or from some third source, that doesn't raise issues of inspiration or inerrancy. So don't panic. <laughs> you see, it's just how is God working this out? But I think uh, you, know, you have these, the, this question here. At least it seems there's some relationship, and that's one way of answering that. Now, the date and the place of writing, we have reliable early tradition that indicates that both, both Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome during the persecution by Nero. So we're talking about, you can't, we can't be that precise in when it was, but say from 64 to 66, 
Okay, that they're both martyred there in Rome. Now, 2 Peter was written shortly before Peter's execution. You can see that in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. So put those together, and it almost certainly is written from Rome around 64 to 66. Because we have a good tradition, he's, they're executed by Nero in that window. He's writing this shortly before then, since we, have, you know, we can't be sure when they're put to death. There's some range there. It's right in there that he's writing this because he's writing this shortly before his execution. So he's in Rome, writing shortly before his execution. Now, the destination and audience, this is why I said there's a little, uh, it's more difficult here to determine where are the people locating to whom he's writing. And the reason it's a little harder, now it's quite possible, it may even be likely, that 2 Peter is sent to the same audience as 1 Peter. Okay, that's, that may be likely. It's certainly possible. Now, if that's certainly the case if the allusion in chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 1 to the former letter, if that's a reference to 1 Peter. Well, if we could know that for sure, that that was a reference to 1 Peter, well, then we'd have it knocked because we would then know that, okay, we know where 1 Peter went. It went to those Gentile Christians in Asia Minor. So if he's writing to them, says, hey, yeah, I wrote to you before, and if that before is the letter of 1 Peter, okay, then we know where they are. So that would, if that's the case, then certainly he's writing to those Christians in Asia Minor. But there's a question about whether that's true. It's possible. It's possible that in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, he's referring to a letter that we no longer have. And you say, oh, how can that possibly be? Well, it would be the same thing as, the, as the Paul's letter to the Corinthians that he notes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. That doesn't mean it's missing. That means that God never intended us to have it. Right? So, I mean, it's possible there was another letter, just like in that case, that, he, that was written to him and that we don't have, and he's referring to that. Now, if that's the case, then we're left with very little to go on in determining where are the people located, the people to whom he's writing. Now, despite having been traditionally classified as a Catholic, small c meaning universal, or general epistle, like when you categorize the documents of the New Testament, that's where you'll find Peter. It'll either be called a Catholic or a general epistle. By that meaning, it's a letter to the church at large. Now, despite that traditional classification, the letter clearly was written to a specific group of Christians who were being threatened by false teachers and who had received before at least one of Paul's letters. So though it's classified as a Catholic, a universal or general epistle, meaning a letter that was just to the church at large, this, like uh, I would say, you know, almost all other writings, it is an occasional document. It is written to a specific group of Christians undergoing uh, a specific problem, and he writes, and that's important because that helps us get into the world and try to see, okay, what's the circumstance, what's the situation? It's different if you sit here and just think, well, no, under the Spirit of God, he's just writing to the church at large. Okay, I think he's writing to, clearly he's writing to specific Christians who are having these problems. So, we have a certain ambiguity and uncertainty about chapter 3, verse 1. Is that letter, in fact, a reference to 1 Peter? It may well be. If it is, then we know where they are. Okay, if it's not... Well, then we're left with little to go on, and the most we can say, I think, in that case, is as Douglas Moo says in his commentary, he says, the most we can say then is that the Christians Peter writes to probably lived in Asia Minor, Macedonia, or Greece, since these are the regions in which Paul ministered and to which he addressed his letters. So he's taking the idea that they apparently had had at least one letter from Paul. He says, this is where Paul ministered and wrote, so we can at least reduce it to that world. Okay, I, th I think there's something to that. He says, for the same, this same reason, we can also surmise that at least most of the Christians Peter addresses in the letter were Gentiles because of the nature of the churches in those regions. Okay, so it's either going to be those people in Asia Minor that he wrote to in 1 Peter, or we can re reduce it to uh, those who lived in Asia Minor, Macedonia, or Greece, probably. And then we'll still be dealing with at least uh, predominantly Gentile Christians. And a couple of statements in the letter... There are a couple of statements in the letter that also may hint that the, that the audience is predominantly Gentile, but those, those can be spun different ways. So it's not all that clear that from the things that are written that you can say, no, definitely I can see that he's writing to predominantly Gentile Christians. All right, now what's the occasion? This is where we get more clarity. 
Why is he writing to this group of Christians? Wherever they're located, what's motivating his letter? Why is he writing to them? And his main reason for writing was to combat certain false teachers that had arisen from within the church and they were threatening the particular community that he's writing to. Okay, now we sometimes, you know, I, I look at churches and we're just, we don't like, the, you know, doctrine and all this kind of stuff and it just makes people uncomfortable. You see so many of the letters, I think, you know, just off, you know, you're thinking of Colossians here, many of the letters that are written to try to protect the church from the danger of false doctrine. And that's what's motivating the Apostle Peter. There were false teachers who had come in, and it's not like who cares what is taught and who cares what is believed. There is danger in false doctrine. Okay? There's danger in it. Now, does that mean that you know, every, every issue in Christianity then is a matter of, okay, that we have to complete? Well, you know, that's not true. <laughs> right? But you do understand that there are dangerous things. There are heresies that come in and can be very spiritually detrimental to people. And that's what he's doing. And he speaks of these false teachers in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and chapter 3, verse 3. He speaks of them in the future tense, but it's quite clear from other places in the letter that they're already present. Okay, in those places, 2, 1 through 3, and 3, verse 3, he refers to them in the future tense, but you can see certainly that they're already there adversely affecting the community. They already are feasting with the church. He says in chapter 2, verse 13, and they're already seeking converts from among the members. You see in chapter 2, verse 14, and chapter 2, verse 19. They have perverted Paul's teaching in chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, and in chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. They're ignoring fundamental Christian truth. So it's clear that they're already there. They're already among them and working. And you say, well, then why does he refer to them in the future in that section, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3? And he probably does that, refers to them in the future to remind his readers that the, that the false teacher's presence is fulfillment of earlier prophetic warnings about the coming of false teachers. In other words, when he uses the future, he's alerting them that these people had been foretold. And now they're there. Because they're clearly there, and he refers to them that way. As Schreiner says in his commentary, he reminded his hearers that the advent of the false teachers was foreknown beforehand, and hence that God reigns even in such perilous times. So I think that's why he's doing, he's doing that. But you have other times, you know, there, there, there may be larger reasons for that tied to this idea of the already and the not yet where we have the notion that you know, the, the future has already broken in in some sense and we're living in this overlap of ages because there are other occasions when Paul goes back and forth future and present when he's dealing with these things. So there may be something to that that's deeper. And in fact, one of the people, uh, Gene Green, raises that possibility. But it makes sense to me to see that he's alerting them through the future tense. They know they're there. He's making clear that they're there. So this is a way of alerting them rhetorically that they were foretold. Okay, that's what I think is happening there. Now, the false teachers, they were, <clears throat> they were doctrinally wrong. They were theologically off. And they were morally corrupt. They denied a future coming of Christ in judgment. That, that was nonsense, that wasn't going to happen. They denied a future coming of Christ in judgment. You can see that in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Read that with chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. So they denied that. They're doctrinally corrupt, theologically off. But they're also they're, they're morally corrupt in that they engaged in all kinds of sins of the flesh. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, chapter 2, verses 10 to 16, 18 to 20. See, Christianity had become for them a license to sin. It had become for them, they were unrestrained. It was like, hey, it's grace, baby. <laughs> you need to chill. Those are my words, but that's the concept. <laughs> you need to chill. It's grace. You see, they were antinomian. They had... They had jettisoned moral restraint. Anti, they were against law, against moral restraint, against commands. And that's how they're, they're just off living 
And you see this throughout there, and this is probably tied, almost certainly tied, to their rejection of Christ's coming in judgment. No, no, no. That's not going to happen. There's not going to be any judgment like that. See, Peter, you know, you, you have these guys that, that you, they wind up saying, listen, this notion that there is going to be this judgment day where you're going to be accountable, nah, it's all grace. Here's what Schreiner says. He says, instead of identifying the opponents precisely, in other words, putting them in certain boxes like are they proto-Gnostics and all this kind of thing, you just don't have enough uh, information and the situation and grasp of the circumstance in the first century is kind of fluid and difficult. So he says, instead of identifying the opponents precisely, we must be content historically with the limited information available to us regarding the false teachers we know that they denied the parousia, the return, the second coming of Christ, and that they were antinomians. Perhaps they drew upon Paul's letters to justify their libertinism. And I think that's what he means when he says there are some people they distort Paul's letters. Well, what are they doing? That's not the only time that's happened. I think you see hints of that in James also, that people took Paul's doctrine of grace and even Paul. You know, you can see that in Paul's letter to the Romans where you had that, that idea of people saying that, hey, well, let's, let's party so grace may abound. And Paul says, nonsense. And so I think that's part of how they're doing, saying, listen, we just, you know, it's all about grace. We're here and let's just live and get rid of these burdensome oughts. We don't need that oughts. We're just footloose, baby. You see, and I think so tied to that is this denial that Christ is coming in judgment. He says their denial of the future coming of Christ probably was linked with the rejection of a future judgment. And so that's how they are and what they're saying and what, how they think about things. And then Peter launches into, and we're actually going to get to the letter, you see. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. He says, Simeon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, to the ones who have received a faith of equal privilege to us through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, our, uh, and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has given to us everything for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and manifestation of divine might, through which things he has given to us the precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become sharers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption in the world caused by lust. Now, Peter, he opens, he identifies himself as a slave, an apostle of Jesus Christ. See, he had been chosen by the Lord to serve as an authoritative representative, and he's writing to them in that capacity. This isn't like reading me writing you something. You see, he's an apostle. He is an authoritative representative. This is... The Spirit of God speaking to these people in the first instance and speaking to us today. This is the Word of God to God's people. So he's speaking in that capacity. He addresses them as those who have received a faith. I think that's the best way to, to take this. Received a faith in that their faith, it wasn't something they had generated on their own. It wasn't something they generated. It had been given to them through the message that had been preached to them, that they had received this faith. As Paul says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Well, how did they get this faith? How did they receive it? It came through this message that had been presented to them, that had been delivered to them. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, that one is called to salvation through the gospel. How is God calling me? Through this message that is being preached, you are being offered faith. It is being presented to you for you to receive it. You are being called to salvation. See, whenever a person hears the gospel, whenever a person hears this message that God the Son became a human being, that he was crucified for humanity's sins, and that he was raised to life and exalted to the highest place, when a person hears that, God is offering that person faith. Here is this message. God, when you hear that message, God is offering to you faith. And if one will accept the truth of that good news, if one will surrender to it, I don't mean just simply 
intellectually saying, I think that's true. That's not biblical faith. If one will surrender to that truth, then one will have what? Will have received the faith that is offered. So here is this message that comes, this saving, rescuing message. And he writes to them, he said, they had received this message. That's what they had done. They are Christians. Right? That's what he would say to us. You have received this faith. We are Christians. And so he's writing, to, he's writing to a group of Christians. Now, Peter doesn't go into this thing about their faith was given to them through the preaching of the gospel, but I think that's the idea that's lurking in this statement that they had received their faith through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think that's what's lurking there. And you say, that seems odd. How does that work? Okay, he says, to the ones who've received a faith of equal privilege to us, they receive this faith through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What I think here is this idea, you get it, it's lurking in there, because when righteousness is attributed to God in the Old Testament, it very often, when it's done, it very often has reference to God's saving activity, his rescuing work. It often has that meaning. I mean, this is the form that his righteousness takes. In Isaiah 46, 13, for example, God promises there through the prophet, he says, I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off in parallel, parallelism, and my salvation will not delay. I bring near my righteousness. It's not far off. My salvation will not delay. Psalm 98, 2, the Lord has made known his salvation. He has made known, he has revealed his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. You see this usage in, a, in a, quite a few of the Psalms. You see it in Isaiah chapter 51, verses 5 and 6, chapter 51, verse 8. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul, he applies this concept of God's righteousness, God's saving work, his saving activity, righteousness as his saving action. In Romans 1.16, Paul applies that to the preaching of the gospel. He says, the gospel is the power of God for salvation, for in it the righteousness of God is being revealed. It's the power of God for salvation because in it the righteousness of God is being revealed. In the preaching of the gospel, what is happening? God's saving action, his bringing people into a right relationship with himself is being revealed in that it's taking place in history. It's being unveiled, it's being revealed. In the preaching of the gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed in that it's taking place in history, his saving action, his rescuing work. So I think you see, I think that's the idea when he says here that they receive this faith through the righteousness of our God. I think that's the notion. I think it's lurking in there that they receive this when that message came out to them. That was the God's saving action, his saving work, his rescuing effort being manifested in this world. So this idea, here's what the, uh, Douglas, Douglas Moo says about the righteousness. He says, this is, he's written a number of comments, wrote a commentary, a major one on Romans, and he wrote this one on, uh, on 2 Peter and Jude. He says, righteousness, dikaiosune, has a broad range of meaning in the Bible. One of its meanings is justice or fairness, and some commentators think that this meaning fits very well here. But righteousness normally refers to the act by which God puts sinners in a right relationship with him, and this seems to be the more likely meaning here. That's how I take it, and that's why I said I think, you know, he doesn't expressly say that, that here they've received this faith through the preaching of the gospel, but I think it's lurking, it's implicit in this idea that they received it through the righteousness of God. Okay, so that's what I, I think that's what he's saying, what's going on there. Now notice here that, that the title God and Savior, it's applied to Jesus Christ. I mean, that's pretty important, isn't it? He says, privileged to us through the righteousness of our God and Savior. Jesus Christ, that's pretty important. And that's recognized that he's referring to Jesus there, that he's recognized by the vast majority of modern commentators and Greek grammarians that that's how to read it. That he is calling Jesus God. And you see that in a number of other texts. John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 18. John 20, verse 28. Romans 9, verse 5. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. 
Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, and quite possibly 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. In all of those, do we have this title, God, applied to Jesus? That's why when you talk to people, no, no, Jesus isn't God. He's a created being. I just said, that's a loser. That's just a flat loser from Jump Street. He is divine. Now, you've got to go on from there and say, okay, that's how the Trinity. People say, well, the Trinity is not anywhere in the Bible. I understand the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the truth is in the Bible. You see, there's one God, but then we also see, well, Jesus is God. The Father is God. The Spirit is God. So what do we do? Well, we say, well, how, does, how is that true? How do we have one God and three persons called God? Well, that's how theologians hacked out the trinity okay one you know one being one essence three subsisting personalities personal distinctions not divisions in the essence of god but here we see jesus is called god he's called that elsewhere and that's an important thing okay so i i think that's important that you that you see that now the faith the faith they received he says is of equal privilege or nrsv says equal standing to us okay to ones who've received a faith of equal privilege to us. Now it's not clear uh, who, to whom the us refers. It could refer to the apostles, or it could refer to Jewish Christians, or it could refer to all Christians other than those he's writing to, because he says us as opposed to you. But they have received a, a uh, privilege, they've received a, a faith that is of equal privilege. Whatever the scope of the us, the point seems to be That the recipients, those he's writing to, they're not second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. That the faith they they received is of equal privilege. The faith receives all the blessings that attaches to the faith of any others. No one is any more a child of God than they are. Whether it be Peter or anybody else. They are Christians having received this faith. And that faith is of equal privilege to that of anybody else. We are all children of God. We'll pick up there next week. Lord willing, thanks for coming.